Like so many organizations in Northeastern Pennsylvania and those that we serve, we're extremely grateful to the Harry and Jeanette Weinberg Foundation. Their support not only of this conference, but the invaluable support that the Weinberg Foundation provides to nonprofit organizations in our region, serving older adults, children, people with disabilities, and many, many others is transformative. I'm pleased to welcome attorney Robert Kelly, an advocate and champion for Northeastern Pennsylvania and chairman of the Board of Trustees for the Harry and Jeanette Weinberg Foundation. Mr. Kelly is a founding partner of the law firm Myers, Breyer & Kelly, where his practice focuses on tax-oriented and operational and transactional planning for individuals, businesses, and tax-exempt organizations. And I will say a true expert in foundation law. Oh. Attorney Kelly will now introduce our afternoon keynote speaker. Thank you, Laura. Um, just want to make sure the, uh, the mic is, everybody could hear me all right in the back? Teddy? Two thumbs up from Teddy. That's great. It's a good sign. Um, thanks so much for having us here this afternoon. Um, thanks, first of all, to Laura and Maggie and the entire team at the Scranton Area Community Foundation for not only conceiving of the, the concept here for today's program, but executing to perfection. Um, we understand it's been a great day so far. Uh, hopefully, we can end the day on a strong note for you here today. Um, I know what you're here to see. You're here to see Rachel, and I will not take too much of the program today. Um, but we're very happy to have Rachel uh, Garble Monroe, who is the president and CEO of the Lambert Foundation, join us today. Drove up. She's going to be heading back tonight. A quick visit. I tell her it's always nicer when you make it to northeastern Pennsylvania on a sunny day because it's a glorious day out there. Um, looks good all the way up and all the way back. So just a quick introduction about myself. Uh, I know many of you in the room, we've had an opportunity to work. I have the privilege of serving as the, a trustee and currently the board chair of the Harry and Jeanette Weinberg Foundation. From that position, I do my best to advocate for the interests of Eastern Pennsylvania. Um, we would say zip codes 1718 and 19. If you are west of the Susquehanna, I'm sorry to tell you, you're probably not a, in the, the target area for funding for the Weinberg Foundation. Um, Many of you have worked with us. The primary focus uh, could be defined in a, a lot of ways by what we don't fund. We're not funding colleges or universities, anything post-secondary. We're not funding cultural and arts. Unfortunately, we don't fund animal organizations that focus on uh, helping animals. What we do is a few basic core areas, which Rachel will talk about, but the general global topic is trying to alleviate and fight poverty. Um, we fund around the world. Um, primary areas where our trustees are, New York, Baltimore, Northeastern Pennsylvania, Chicago, the Bay Area. We have a presence in Hawaii because Mr. Weinberg, our founder, devised to us upon his death a significant Hawaiian real estate portfolio, which we still manage. We also are very active in Israel and the former Soviet Union. So when people talk to me about the Weinberg Foundation and funding, what I try to emphasize is I try my best to advocate for Northeastern Pennsylvania, but you have to understand when you're applying to us, you're being judged and, and compared to other applicants on a global basis. The other point we try our best to make is that uh, we are not just a funder, we try to be a resource, a source of information. And we tell our uh, program committee of team members in Baltimore that if someone seeks found, uh, Weinberg Foundation funding, and if we have to say no, and we hate to say no, it's always much more fun to say yes than to say no, but on those times when we say no, we owe you two things. One would be a good explanation as to why it is that you don't qualify for Weinberg Foundation funding. And the second thing is try our best to point you in the direction of another organization that we have funded, who may be providing services that are similar to your organizations, who we think is doing it just a little bit better, in the hopes that we can introduce you to them and that you can learn from them. So I know that the focus of the program today is learning. There's my first use of the term learning, because we're going to try to hit it as many times as we can today. It's a drinking game. Yeah, so <laughs> only water. Um, but, but we do hope that uh, even if you are not successful in obtaining Weinberg Foundation funding, it can become a learning experience and that we can introduce you to other organizations from which you can learn and with whom you can operate in the future. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Rachel Garbo Monroe. As we say, the Board of Dr Trustees, the Board of Directors of a nonprofit organization really has one role, and that is to select a qualified executive to run the organization. The only great, organ the only great um, decision we've made as trustees has been <laughs> identifying Rachel Garble Monroe, who at the time was our chief operating officer, as the person who was best suited to run the organization. 
She's coming up on her 10-year anniversary as CEO. We have a great relationship in terms of how we work together. We think that we have found the perfect balance between where the board should be and where the executive staff should be. Um, I do enjoy working with Rachel. I'm happy that she found some time to come to see us here in Northeastern Pennsylvania. And with that, I will turn it over to Rachel, tell you a little bit more about herself and about the Weinberg Foundation. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. So I hope you're not too tired after a long day, which those we've talked to said has been really quite wonderful and extraordinary so far, and we'll try not to disappoint together. Uh, and I'm hoping that this is a little bit of a back and forth uh, between Rob or Bob, whichever one you call him, <laughs> and myself. Um, and then we'll have time for you guys to ask blunt questions, I hope. So um, I've been at the foundation for 14 years, for almost 10 of them as president and CEO. And if you reflect on what that means and what that represents, uh, and I talk about the past 10 years and where we've come and gone, if I had an image for you in 2009, it would be an image of five extraordinary men who were the board members of the foundation, one of whom served as the president. And if I had that picture for you today, you would see three extraordinary men, two extraordinary women, and myself as a non-board member, president and CEO. And one of those two women is an African-American who is a Jew by choice. So it's been extraordinary change in the composition of the board in every possible way you can imagine. It also represents, as Rob mentioned, great diversity geography-wise so that we are learning from around the country the best models and best practices that hopefully we can replicate in our priority communities, including among them Northeast Pennsylvania. So we'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, my quick story is, who in the room has been to Baltimore before? Wow. OK, I hope you liked it. I hope we behaved ourselves. <laughs> um, it, is a, it is a city that has two very different stories. And I speak a lot about the, the moment in our city today and the good and the bad of our city today. And so the Weinberg Foundation gives this year $125 million in grants, $25 million in the city of Baltimore. Uh, all focused on direct services for low-income and vulnerable individuals, and it is a tough, tough fight. And I'm sure many of you doing the work you're doing in nonprofits, is that you're experiencing that in your own communities and seeing that landscape. So uh, today and this week, this time together is really time for all of you to refresh and get a break from that and learn from one another and come together. So I hope that it is effective for you. And with that, all I need to say about myself is, um, I went to Northwestern and Kellogg, which I'm um, very biased for in every conversation on earth. And I married and have three kids. One is at University of Michigan, one is at Indiana, and one is a senior in high school. So we are a Big Ten family. And um, I have truly the best job in Baltimore. It's not an easy job. It's not without stress and crazy. But I get to ground myself in a mission when I'm having a bad day. And for me, that keeps me going now for 14 years at the same place with a sense of urgency and a sense of mission and a sense of compassion. So I'm very grateful for that. So you, you've admitted that your husband's an Ohio State grad. They've he got is? four members of the Big Ten covered. I don't call her on Saturday afternoons in the fall because there's always, <laughs> there's always drama somewhere in the family. Northwestern always loses. So, uh, yeah. um, this afternoon, what we want to do is just spend about uh, 30 minutes or so, uh, as, as Rachel said, bantering back and forth with some Q&A. We want to leave 20 minutes or so at the end for, for questions from, from the floor. Um, we hope you could start to now jot those down because we really do want to have some interaction with those of you uh, who are attending here today. Uh, one other housekeeping matter I wanted to mention was a thank you to our co-sponsor, which is um, the Moses Taylor Foundation, uh, to Latita Smith and her team. They've been outstanding partners in this community and uh, really want to recognize them. So can I start it off with a question for you? Sure. Um, how many of you have sought advice from Rob related to a nonprofit? OK, well, there are going to be a lot more hands after this afternoon. Uh -huh. um, many, many people come and see you to ask questions, whether it's uh, regarding their mission, their program, their staffing, their financials, their legal issues. And I thought it might be helpful to begin by sharing what are the most common conversations you're having, what are the most common challenges nonprofits in this area are facing that you're trying to help mitigate with. OK, thanks. So the first one, the most common question, obviously, is what can I do to increase the likelihood of obtaining Weinberg Foundation funding? Not surprising. <laughs> that is the kind of question we want. We invite people to call us and say, 
Uh, here's what our organization does. We're contemplating expanding a program, capital project, because 50% of our grant dollars go to capital projects. So the question is always, what can we do? And we always say, before you write to us, call us. We, we really want you to, if you look at our website, you'll find every member of our team, our program team, and you'll find their email address and you'll find their phone number. We literally want you to pick up the phone and call us and talk to us before you submit. We don't want you to spend time writing letters or filling out grant applications if it's just not a match for where we're funding. So please don't hesitate to pick up the phone and call. I normally tell people with me, don't email me, call me, because there's a better likelihood that I'm gonna get a, a, a quicker turnaround on a response than with an email. Um, the types of issues that we hear from our community, um, and I, I talk regionally for northeastern Pennsylvania, you know, we're going through something of a catharsis. There's an awful lot of, of, of change going on in our community. I know there's always change going on, but right now there's issues of scale. Rachel will talk a little bit later about an experiences we had recently in Baltimore with small organizations and, and, and receiving small grants. We understand that organizations that, um, and, and small is hard to define, but smaller organizations and smaller grants have an important role in what the Weimarie Foundation does, but ultimately scale is becoming more and more important in the 21st century. We see it in, in here in our community. As, as funding and reimbursement sources shift, organizations are forced to come together and work together. We encourage that. We will fund the cost of having a professional out-of-town facilitator help two organizations or three organizations talk if, if combination talks are really at the point where we think they will be fruitful. Um, it, it's just a, a reality of our life right now that there will be most likely fewer and fewer a lower number of organizations, but those that are, remain will be slightly larger and have scale. The second thing we talk about is don't try to incubate every great idea yourself. There's no pride in being the first, there's, there's no shame in being the first adopter. If we can help you find a better model, if we can help you find somebody who's doing it really well, we want to introduce you to them, we want to spend money to make sure you get together with them, and if you can find ways to, to incorporate what they're doing in your program, and we think that'll increase the chance of, of you getting Weinberg funding, we're 100% we're in favor of that. So don't be afraid to look around. And that's often the hardest, really one of the hardest things to do. The last point I'll say, the thing we talk most often about, is the importance of a professional development effort. Um, when we look at organizations, a lot of times we see so much effort that go into the annual events, the annual galas, and they're wonderful events, they're great ways to show your organization to the community but that can't be a replacement or a substitute for good old-fashioned grant writing, as I look at Susan in the room. There's, I'm sure a number of you, how many show of hands, how many of you here devote some or all of your time to grant writing and seeking? Right? It is just such a critical part of it, and I will be frank, I think those of us in northeastern Pennsylvania are a little bit behind the times on that. We have to step up the effort. So there are organizations like AFP that if you're not a member, we encourage you to join. Um, because the approach to it is really critical, I think, for the long-term survival of many of the organizations. You have to start, we have to, as a community, find the funds, and it, and it may not necessarily be here. So there's the Robert Wood Johnsons, and there's, there's large funders around the country that you may very well qualify for funding from. We just encourage you, to, as best you can, to reach out. We can co-fund with them. We can't be the sole funder. Find other funding sources if you can. Um, on your end, You've got coming up on your 10th anniversary, February of 2020, 10 years at CEO. Uh, as CEO, tell me in those 10 years, what are some of the most significant changes and challenges you've encountered? Uh, so other than my hair color, um, <laughs> I would say that uh, one of the things we've observed of nonprofits is uh, the, you, nonprofits are getting better and better about working with foundations. 10 years ago, it was still very much we work with individual donors, and we weren't quite sure how to navigate this foundation space, and we lumped them all together. So it's good that nonprofits have segmented their funding groups into the categories and working with them appropriately. The reporting we get is different than what you're going to be asked of from an individual donor giving you a grant. And one of the very annoying facts about foundations is to know one foundation is to know one foundation. Um, but to the extent you are eager to manage the foundations funding you, we have had other nonprofits come to us and say, these are the seven foundations funding us. We would like to merge all of your questions and do one report to all seven of you. Is that OK? Of course, that's wonderful. So think about how you can work with us differently that will actually make you have more efficiency and potentially more effectiveness. I would also say that 
uh, there's a strong and better increased understanding of not just the mission and being relentless to that mission, but also the best business practices for a nonprofit. So working with a strong lawyer, working with a strong outside compensation consultant, working with strong auditors from a, a firm that is reputable, all of those things have really been elevated over the past decade. And they're for the greater good of the work of the nonprofits. I would also say an increase to talent and to professional staff and to paying those professional staff what they're worth. We do not judge a 990 poorly if you're paying someone six figures if they're delivering high quality professional abilities to that nonprofit. We may actually judge you poorly if you have a multi-million dollar budget and you only have one staff person making $40,000. We understand it's heavy lifting, so demonstrate that you respect and value and want to retain your staff and also create ladders. I would say 10 years ago, I didn't see a single budget from a nonprofit with professional coaching. And we see it often and we're happy to support that as part of an operating cost for a nonprofit. So you are seeing a tilt in that direction. Um, much more focus from foundations on proactive work, on partnerships and collaborations than on just writing a grant, which is very important but is not driving boards the same way it did. So our board is excited when they see a collaborative approach, as Rob just said, of multiple nonprofits working together or a large idea that's going to be across nine cities as opposed to in one area. So we're seeing a lot of those trends. And finally, I would say um, two things, a lot of evaluation and measurement work. Um, I used to say a lot when I would meet with nonprofits and explain what we cared about and wanted to look at, there was resistance to evaluation. And I would finally end up by saying, my brother and I have never played tennis or backgammon without keeping score. And we're certainly not going to distribute Harry Weinberg's money without keeping score. So figure it out. And I think nonprofits are figuring that out. And that has been an evolution over the past decade. And finally, I, I can't state with enough emphasis the importance of diversity, both of staff and board, to be reflective of community. I'm proud that Weinberg is doing that. There are many others doing that. And frankly, there are many that are not. And having a sensitivity to that has really been something over the past decade that has grown. So just a, a few follow-ups on that one. Um, board diversity, uh, certainly in our region, um, I emphasize to folks, it's, it's OK to put a 35-year-old on your board. Don't, don't be afraid. They're fine, OK? The more, the better. Um, because what we see is sort of the, 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 the graying of our board population. And there are a lot of wonderful young folks here in our community. Um, call us, call Scranton Area Community Foundation, call Moses. Th there are a lot of people out there who I think would bring a lot of thought diversity to your board. That's just strictly on the issue of age. Don't be afraid. When we see somebody who's been board chair for 35 years, that's an issue. Right? That's probably time for you to start talking about governance really looking at governance from the top down and, and maybe bringing some changes to the organization. Um, you mentioned earlier auditors. So a lot of organizations have a hard time biting the bullet to pay for the audit, particularly smaller organizations, because it's expensive and we know it's expensive and we hate to make you pay for that. But we can point to an organization here in our region that recently had a, a significant embezzlement because they didn't have an, an audit done. Um, they're important, no matter how um, if you have a small number of transactions, it, it, despite that, the audits matter. Um, it has to also be an auditing firm that understands nonprofits. We can tell when we look at your 990 if your CPAs don't do a lot of these, because those are the tea leaves we read. And if I'm going to say, what are the things you look at when the application comes in? How do you triage it? What are the things that would jump out as maybe warning signs? Yeah. That might point you away from, from, fund, from funding. So I would say when you, you know, this first conversation we have, which Rob encouraged all of you to have this first conversation first, that's when we begin to learn. And my first cautionary tale would be don't have those conversations without knowing who Weinberg is, what we do and don't fund. Spend the time on the website. You'd be amazed how many people we meet with who say, oh, my mom was part of a nonprofit 23 years ago that got funding, and they did this, and I'm here. So. Do your homework, which I'm sure you all do, but it's astounding to find people who don't. And in those conversations, for example, I will say, you know, one of the things we often ask for is three years of a budget. And there are nonprofits that say, oh, that's easy, no problem. And there's ones that you look at you like, oh, God, that's going to take us four months to get done. So 
you know, thinking about teeing up all of the things that you know a foundation is going to request. We're transparent on the website and show everything that we're going to ask. You'll see it. Um, it is impressive to us when those materials are done professionally, cleanly, and well, and they correspond to one another. We actually do look at the audited financials compared to the budget, compared to the 990. And if they don't have synchronicity, that is a red flag for us. Um, and often they don't. Uh, we also look for things like, um, how are you transparent with us, right? What are the challenges that you are facing? It is powerful to hear from a nonprofit that we're struggling with an issue and to share that with us as opposed to saying everything is perfect. Weinberg isn't perfect, we all have challenges. And that's the kind of partnership and relationship that we're looking for. And we're sensitive to whether or not we hear that from the nonprofit. So I would really encourage you to be transparent, not only on the good, but also on the challenging. If you're, if you're one year into a two year grant and something is a little bit off course, call us. We're most likely inclined to maybe help you find a solution to it, put you in the direction of someone, pay for a consultant to help you get back on track. It doesn't bother us, just, just level with us uh, up front is all we can say. Uh, the second thing that we wanted to talk about a little bit earlier is evaluation. We understand that it's always a challenge when foundations say to you, as part of this grant, you have to have evaluation and give us data. Ask us for the money. Right? Include it in your budget or your request. Because we, we're all about evaluation. One of our uh, trustees who joined us last year, uh, his name is Gordon Berlin. He's from New York. He runs an organization called MDRC. If any of you have not been to MDRC's website, you should go there. We say MDRC used to stand for something, it doesn't, it's just MDRC yeah. now. Uh, but what they do is they design randomized control trials to prove what works in the area of you know, education, poverty, hunger, all the sort of areas where we fight. So we have somebody on our board who does nothing but evaluation his whole career. He's gonna be tuned into your grant application and how you're gonna evaluate how you're doing. But build it into the budget. There's nothing wrong with saying we need X dollars for our budget and Y for the evaluation component. We will respect you. Um, if you do that. Yeah, in fact, there are times that we have funded part or all of an evaluation if we found that it would be meaningful and help that nonprofit learn. And we care about the, the concept of intellectual curiosity continuing at the nonprofit. Often we will go and meet and I will say to the person running the nonprofit, what's a book you've read lately that's relevant to your work? I get really excited when someone rattles off three books. I get really nervous when I get nothing. So I yeah. thought Maggie was going to ring the bell every time we say learn. We, she got, we got it in there, so we said learn. Um, but in that evaluation is an important way for the organization itself to learn, to step back and objectively try to evaluate what it's done with the grant dollars and how the program is progressing. Yeah. Let me ask you a question. The, the number one thing that I think is a marker of a very strong nonprofit at the end of the day after we look at all of this data is a strong, talented, professional senior team and a pro strong board. I can find a lot of nonprofits that I would give an A plus score to because their senior staff and their board are extraordinary. I cannot find a nonprofit that I would give an A plus to that has a crummy board and a crummy staff. They're not there. And so Weinberg has really begun to care about this agenda of talent. And I just wanna ask you, Rob, to talk about talent and its intersectionality in Scranton and if that's made its way here as a big agenda or not. Okay, so, so we talk about the poison pill. Weinberg will from time <laughs> to time in a grant agreement put in what we call a poison pill which says if your executive, if your CEO departs we have the right to cancel the grant. What that is signaling is you think you've got a really extraordinary leader but we don't see that you've developed a senior team beneath the leader and we're really concerned that this person if they depart is gonna put the program at risk. Don't take that the wrong way. Here's what we're telling you. You have to invest in talent. And one of the biggest challenges I see in our region, and we've had this discussion with our other funders, is you, you can't be afraid to pay yourself, and you can't be afraid to pay money to attract talent. If we look at a 990, and there's no salaries disclosed, or if there is only one person whose salary is disclosed, or if that person's salary is five times the next highest paid person, that's a warning sign that you are not going to be able to attract and retain talent to make this organization sustainable. We never, I can't remember us ever looking at a 990 and saying, oh my God, I can't believe how much they're paying them, except if it's too low. Right? Yeah, that's true. Do not be afraid, and I don't think that's uncommon at other foundations. I don't think, and in Northeast Pennsylvania, there's sort of this fear that, oh my God, if I'm making six figures and it's reported on the 990, the Scranton Times is gonna put me on the front page, which they do from time to time. 
but it's ignore it. I mean, I have to say it for the, from the funder's perspective, it's an important part of it. We as nonprofit organizations have to invest in talent. You have to offer a career ladder to individuals, otherwise you're not going to entice them either from another nonprofit or for the for-profit sector to come and work in your organization. And I think that anybody that is sort of trying to apply those, you know, charity navigator standards, that's, that's not what we do. It's not the way we work. So if I look at your 990, I can pretty quickly triage where the money is, where it's coming in and where it's going, and adequate allocation to, to, to yourself for training, basic pay, benefits, Something that's going to be able to keep your people for a long time is something that we value, we attach, attach importance to. Yeah. Um, along the lines of mistakes, I just want to share a few thoughts about some of the things that we see. So um, one of the things that nonprofits have done is they'll be talking to us about their work, and it's you know 20 degrees off what we fund. And they'll say, oh, we do that. We can do that. And it's our first exchange with them, and so we want to be supportive, so we fund it, even though they're new at it. They don't really want to do it, but they want to try to secure Weinberg funding because they see it as a gateway to more Weinberg funding, potentially. But because it's not in their mission, they do a crummy job. We don't do a good job of evaluating it, and then it sort of breaks down as a poor relationship instead of a successful new funding partnership. So stick to your knitting. And don't be afraid to say to the, to the foundation or to the funder, I think it's great that's what you fund. That's not exactly what we do. Love to persuade you to fund what we do, but it's not exactly what we do. By the, by the way, on that topic, commend St. Joseph's Center and Sister Mary Alice Jackman on us here. You may have read in the paper about the initiative they launched to bump up uh, the base pay for their home caregivers to $15 an hour. We think that's an important step, step. I think that was courageous for you to do that and to call the paper and say we want to tell everybody that we're doing it. Um, I'm not sure what the ripple effect is. But, but yeah. And, and, and more importantly, you knew that if you found foundation funding to do it, it would become sustainable. So hats off to you and your team for identifying the opportunity, because that, that is what helps our, our community. So, yeah. um, Coming back to boards in particular, board. Uh, um, so the Weinberg Foundation has migrated over the last dozen years from an organization that was trustee dominated to one that is um, an outside independent board of trustees that has vested authority in a senior executive team. So one of the questions we often ask in the course of evaluating a grant is basically, is that balance correct? How do you find the balance between how much, how intrusive the board should be, how involved the board should be, and do they have an appropriate level of trust in their executive team? Again, if we sense that there is a board that has a, an executive director who they're really not trusting, that for us is a warning sign. You need to communicate to us that there's a good karma between the board and the executive team. There's trust there, because that's another thing that will certainly make the decision a little bit easier for us. Yeah, I agree. Um, Rachel, let me talk to you about, if you can for a moment, um, the employee giving program mm -hmm. at Weinberg, because we've learned some interesting things from that recently. So uh, we, neither of us can take credit for the genesis of this program, but we're proud that it continues and has morphed into what it is today at Weinberg. Briefly stated, uh, every other year, every full-time employee at the Weinberg Foundation, from our receptionist to just beneath me, participates in this project. And they make a recommendation for a $20,000 grant for a nonprofit that fits our mission. So the woman who cleans our building, the man who does IT, the man who is our CFO, and everyone in between participates in this process. They go on a site visit, they write up a grant report, they present it to me, the board approves it ultimately, and we have an event that looks very much like this room where every employee gets up to speak and for a minute or two explain why they picked this particular nonprofit, and then someone from the nonprofit gets up and speaks and talks about what this means to them. And um, it is first and foremost the best professional development the Weinberg Foundation does. Uh, the number of people in my office freaking out that they don't publicly speak and that's not in their job description and they really shouldn't have to do this. <laughs> Uh, is you know more than two handfuls and I smile at them and say you're doing it and when it's over I often get unbelievable responses from those colleagues about the experience they had and there's also deep personal connection there's a woman who works for us who seven or eight years ago gave uh, her grant recommendation to a nonprofit in Baltimore City that is a homeless shelter for women and their children and she said they fit like a hand in a glove our mission our work our standards Everything checks every box. It's not the only reason I picked it. I picked it because I was born there. 
And it's the first time in my life I've been into the cycle of giving, not in the cycle of receiving. And I could weep telling you about a half a dozen other stories. We have another man who's our controller who talked about a nonprofit he funded that helps young men in Baltimore City who are violent. And his brother was in this program for four years, and it was the best four years he had with his brother until his brother was killed. And so it's a very powerful experience for us to come together as a community and to hear these stories. And uh, Rob often speaks about the power of a $20,000 grant can be extraordinary. And we do not minimize that. At the same time, we have to balance the impact of grants that are scalable grants where we can impact the lives of thousands instead of tens or twenties. And we need to be able to do both well. The challenge is sometimes we do a lot of the little well, we don't do so much of the big well, and so we have to figure out how to do that better. So one of the examples in Northeastern Pennsylvania, as you know, um, 20 years ago, Weinberg Foundation worked with the CEO, Commission on Economic Opportunity, to get the, what is now the Weinberg Food Bank up and running with a large uh, support also from the McGowan family. Um, we do think that in terms of hunger issues, we need to start from the top down. That doesn't minimize the importance of food pantries and small food kitchens, which we do try to fund from time to time. But from our perspective, if we're trying to address hunger systemically, most of our dollars will likely flow into a large community or region-wide program like the Weinberg Food Bank. Um, we fund some applications and inquiries. They're normally done on a smaller basis through a different program. Through, through local food pantries. We appreciate what they do, but we will encourage them, if you want a small grant from the Weinberg Foundation, participate and join the network. Be, be a part of the network, because you will only enhance the ability to serve your target populations if you're, if you're hooking into the, the, to the regional food banks. Can you talk about some of the convenings that you've helped lead here to try to move towards collaboration and perhaps scale? So, so I think that we all recognize the challenges of our community. I don't think there'd be a lot of disagreement within the room as to where the needs are. There were two that the Weinberg Foundation put our finger on. One is we receive grants from around the country and around the world for workforce development, jobs programs, and they're, they're inspirational. We see some really great programs. We get very few, close to zero from northeastern Pennsylvania. So we asked the Aspen Institute to come in for four days. Many of you in the room participated in it to talk about identifying why it is in northeastern Pennsylvania our systemic approach to workforce development jobs is maybe a little bit behind the rest of the country. We have a report that's coming soon, we promise, from, with, with recommendations. And that's been just an opportunity for a lot of different people in the community to get together to talk about one area where we think we could get improvements by replicating good models from elsewhere in the country. Um, the second one we did recently was we convened a, a two-day meeting on rural aging with an emphasis on health care. The John A. Hartford Foundation out of New York spends an awful lot of money on, on uh, older adults and aging. They came in and led the program. We heard some really interesting, uh, some folks from South Dakota, from Maine, other people around the country. Brian was there, I think, will attest to the fact that it was a very worthwhile day to just hear about other ways to deal with aging, our aging population, and the fact that they may be 50 miles from their physician, and they may be 100 miles from a dentist who is willing to see them. So we when you identify needs that are more beyond the doors of just your organization, if it's something that truly is region-wide, call us, call Latita, right? call the community foundations, whoever they may be. We like to hear what the programs are, and if we can do more than simply write a check, if we can help bring people together to try to address on a region-wide basis the solutions, that's the way we'd like to try to help out. Um, how about a question to you, as I'm just keeping my eye on the clock here, we're getting close to Q&A time. Um, some of the examples of the best practices, emerging trends that you're seeing, and inevitably it's going to come back to some of the, the major metropolitan areas we're funding in. Mm -hmm. So um, the Bay Area, Chicago, New York, Tel Aviv, Yeah. Right? Um, tell us what you're seeing that gets you excited. So uh, there's some very similar trends that are happening. One in the United States is large foundations that used to fund nationally wherever are now picking a certain number of cities and focusing. Bloomberg's picking in one program 30 and one program 80. We are really focused on seven or eight. Um, Gates is also picking cities now instead of just funding throughout the country in most cases. And then others are narrowing their area of focus in program area. So um, MacArthur has done this, Kresge has done this. At Weinberg, we used to have 40 areas of funding. Now we have 14. 
and they're all under the themes of housing, health, education, jobs, and community services. So you're seeing a narrowing of focus. And the, the unhelpful but visual reality of describing that in foundation circles is peanut butter smeared across the country, or do you sort of you know, lay it thicker in a smaller area? And so you're seeing people wanting to go deeper in certain areas geographically or programmatically than just go everywhere. Uh, you're also seeing some real focus on talent and spending money on talent, which I won't repeat. You're seeing a lot of focus on collaboration. Robin Hood Foundation is coming to Northeast Pennsylvania. That's the first time they're coming here and they're leaving New York and going to eight other cities, among them Baltimore, Chicago, and the Bay Area. Uh, that's exciting. There's going to be funding through that from Gates and Robin Hood coming to Northeast Pennsylvania. Uh, you're seeing a lot of foundation board changes along the lines of what we've already discussed. But at the end of the day, what I would also say is effective grant making, effective nonprofit management is both an art and a science. And it's not just the data and the numbers, which is critically important to be done well and in best business practice. But it is also the humanity in which we do this work and the culture that we build within our organizations. Um, you know, I like to talk to the receptionist in every place I go. I spoke to Rob's, who I thought was awesome, and she likes to be outside during lunch and after work and found out what it's like working at his law firm. And um, living hell, living hell, she said. She loves it. <laughs> she loves it. And um, we have, I'll share one story. We call it the Shakira Factor at Weinberg. Mm -hmm. When you come and interview at Weinberg, whether you're early on time or late, your last interview is typically with me, and you've already met with a gazillion people. And no matter when you get there, you sit in the reception area for 10 minutes. And after I meet with you, and if I meet with you, you checked all the boxes, right? You have your PhD in poverty, blah, 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 from Hopkins, and you've worked at another foundation and whatever. So that should go fine. When you leave, my first call is to Shakira, a woman who was at our front desk. And if Shakira says you were on the phone being arrogant to someone, or you didn't ask her a single question about herself or working there, you're not hired. It's over. There so far are 11 people who that has happened to who have called me. There's more than 11 it's happened with, but 11 have called me. And the first question that I ask each of these 11 people so far is, what's the name of the woman at our front desk? And there's crickets on the phone. And I say, her name is Shakira, now her name is Alana. And she had a vote, and I have a vote, because our culture is not a hierarchy. And you didn't respect that and understand it. And that's OK. You have a brilliant resume, but you're not the right fit for our culture. I want you to go to the homeless shelter and be respectful of everyone there, both staff and client. And if you can't do that in our building, you're certainly not going to do that there. Um, Southwest Airlines, when they interview chief executive level positions, the driver picks you up at the airport. They say, we'll have a driver at the airport, and they'll take you back to the airport. The driver is part of the search team, and the driver reports about the experience. So I am a believer in that, and that culture of your organization matters in how you deliver the mission. So balancing that art and science and doing it well for me is sort of the marker of best quality. So I, I want to go to the audience for some questions. If we have time at the end, I want to come back to have you talk a little bit about Leading Edge, which I do think is an innovative program that okay. is inspirational. But at this point, we have about uh, 10 minutes or so to go, Maggie. Is that right? How do you want to do Q&A? So um, I'm having them use the app. There, there's an, uh, questions for the Weinberg Foundation is so cool. in the message app, uh, just because we don't have microphones to go around the room. So I encourage you to send your questions. They've already started coming in. So I'll, I'll read them from here. OK, fine, okay. fine. Thank you for telling me how to pronounce Hoover, too. I would really appreciate it. Yeah, the Hoover. <laughs> I hope um, you're all enjoying it. Good. Okay, question. Um, Fire away. All right. So first question, Brian Ebersol. Uh, what advice? <laughs> <laughs> they might have thought it's anonymous. Well, so who's no. the next question from? No, no. <laughs> that's. It, it's kind of the. He's been the first person to ask questions the whole time. So okay. that's the. <laughs> what advice do you have for organizations to identify partners or collaborators to incubate projects and ideas? Projects and ideas. Yeah, so, get, my first one is, don't get mad at another organization because they got a grant and you didn't. It is not a zero-sum game. Plenty of money to go around. We have to get rid of some of our sharp elbows. We have to learn to work together. I know it's trite. I know it's easy to say. But the first one would be, demonstrate to us that you truly have the ability to work, treat the other organization as an equal, as a true equal partner. So I, I think that. Um 
you know, we, we were asked to fund a food program, and I, sa I said in this meeting with the potential grant recipient, how many food programs are within two miles of your particular location? And they said, we're the only one. I said, come to my laptop. And I typed in food providers, and there were six within three miles of where they were. And there was lots of overlap. And so what I would say is it's a lot easier to come together than you think. It's actually pretty simple if you put the ego aside and you think about the mission. And if the North Star is we're all focused on jobs or we're all focused on access to health care or we're all focused on living in community as we age or whatever it might be, there should be agenda that can be shared around that. Um, and I would also say start small and, you know, don't throw away good in the pursuit of perfect. Col collaboration is, is some part science, some part, part art. Don't be afraid to ask somebody to help serve as a facilitator, somebody who's seen as a true, honest broker, independent, you know, third party. We will fund the cost of bringing in a facilitator to try to help organizations talk about collaboration because we think it's a very good investment in the community. But, um, Plenty of opportunities abound. We just we know that the folks. If you're here in the room today, it's because you're open to that type of those forms of, of collaboration. Thanks. Yeah. So the next question uh, from Mary Pat Ward is: As a government funder for the city of Scranton, um, who is seeing more restrictive criteria under HUD, such as the requirement of income verification from parents for public service programs for children and teens, even homeless teens, how can the government and foundations like Weinberg come together to provide holistic funding, meet the needs of our communities, and these vital public services? So one great example, and I'm happy to. I don't know who asked the question. If you'll. Um, if you want to connect in the job, there's a very similar comparison in the job space. Every state has an entity in Baltimore, it's called the Jacob Franz Institute. I don't know what it's in the state of Pennsylvania. Every nonprofit that, or, or government entity that is providing job training, placement, coaching, and ongoing support to any individual, the wage records are tracked. And those clients sign off on it. So those of you saying, wait, they're legal issues, you're wrong, you can get around it. There's one entity in every state that does it, and they report out to everyone, and they have solved a lot of these issues on the job side. So there may be transferable learning in the category that you're talking about. So we, we recognize that government funding is an essential part of the budgets for, most, for many organizations. We can be more flexible than the government. We can try to complement it to try to help. It. So we're, we're constantly trying to adapt. We understand the rules and restrictions you live with, and we're just trying to help fill in the gaps. Foundations and funders should be able to show that because they're not subject to this. We have rules. We have rules we have to follow, but certainly not the same uh, rigidity that the government has. You've likely seen some effective organizational learning practices in the various organizations that you've funded nationwide. Can you talk about anything that stands out to you as an example that works? Learning practices? Yeah, effective organizational learning practices. Was that your question, Maggie? It's not. Okay, let's see. <laughs> so if I take that as professional development for organizations, I don't know if that's the right frame from whoever asked the question. You can yell at me and say no. Um, yeah. Okay. Oh. Okay. <laughs> um, you know, we have spent time and money bringing in professional um, experts in their areas to do trainings for our staff. So. There is a lawyer who's a woman in New York who came and did a training for our staff and many board members on harassment in the workplace in the Me Too Time's Up moment and what's appropriate and not appropriate in work. Um, it was a very uncomfortable thing for everyone to come to and it was a very successful training. She's gone on to train in 30 other places. We had the uh, Racial Equity Institute from North Carolina come and do a racial equity training for the staff. Again, not an easy room to walk in and have that conversation. Incredibly powerful learning. So for us, it's about what are the topics that matter in our work and how do we present that to the staff in a way that really pushes agenda and learning, even if initially it's a little bit uncomfortable. I don't know if that answers your question. We, we certainly respect and support organizations that provide college tuition, tuition assistance programs as just a standard mm -hmm. benefit that, are off, that is offered. Um, we're not normally targeting funding toward that specifically, right? We aren't, that'd be a little bit too narrow a, a, a subtopic for funding within a grant, uh, grant application. Um, the other is just in terms of where else we see you in the community. Um, if you're here today, you're here to learn. We mentioned that earlier. So 
Um, how much is allocated toward professional staff development? And if I drill down on that number, how much of it is the national convention versus how much of it is really getting people out to programs that are going to help them uh, advance their personal skill set. Yeah. If you've applied to Weinberg in the past three years, there's four questions about how much you spend on professional development within your budget and what your biggest challenges are, because we're trying to track that and see what the trends are and what the numbers are. And I'm happy to report, even though the, the number set aside is small, it is at least growing a little bit. Excellent. Um, how, do you, how do you suggest, what suggestions do you have for connecting um, uh, with strong board candidates to our area, the nonprofits? As you mentioned, the focus on strong board and senior staff, what recommendations would you have? I, I think you start the question by saying what you're looking for. Right? I need youth, I need diversity, I need somebody who's got experience in a certain area. And I think you have to ask at least five different people. Um, it, there's a great, so, um, you know, um, Leadership Lackawanna is one program that is supposed to be training folks to be eligible to go out and serve on, uh, on boards and get more involved in the community. I don't know how, if any of you in this room have participated. Are any of you graduates of one of the leadership local programs, right? Um, that's a starting point, but um, talk to the funders is what I normally say, because we're a lot of times seeing folks who are involved in the community who are um, who are very active, and we will point out to organizations that they've got to, we know somebody's going to retire off of their board. There's, there's a great 28-year-old out there that just came back and did a few years in Silicon Valley who was great. I mean, go for youth is, is, is what I, I say more than anything, because the energy matters. Yeah. Um, what advice do you have for funders and grantees to build stronger, more transparent relationships? I'll punt. Uh, so Mort Mandel, who's a billionaire living in Cleveland slash Florida, focuses all of his grant making on leadership. And the quote that he would say if he was here with a very, you know, fist on the table is, it is all about the who. So for me, there's not a technical manual that says this is how we partner together, right? You do these four things and we do these five things. Money makes the relationship complicated, period, the end. After that, we can either have helpful, honest, collaborative conversations, or it can be a funder service delivery relationship. And Weinberg has re worked really hard to not make it a about the money conversation. The money is one of the agenda items, but then as Rob has said, there's so many other agenda items that we genuinely care about and want to cover. I will say if the grantee is telling us the world is flowery and Weinberg is perfect and we're just wonderful, we push away from the table, right? We don't want the, the polite compliment. We want the honest conversation and we want partners who want the honest conversation back. But those who are willing to do that, they're very meaningful. I learn an enormous amount from our nonprofits and many projects we have funded have begun because I've been at breakfast, lunch, or dinner with a nonprofit leader who's been talking about something they're concerned about and I'm able to say, well, three other people I've had lunch with in the past two months have talked about that. Why don't we get together? And all of a sudden, there's an agenda. So can, can I just, can you talk about Leading Edge for a minute? Just because I do think it's one of the so, strong programs. So um, Bridgespan, Bridgespan is like a really strong consulting entity in the nonprofit sector, like a Boston consulting like a group. Like McKinsey. And, or McKinsey. Yeah. And they um, did a study four or five years ago that said 70%, 70 percent, seven zero of all nonprofit CEOs will turn over in the next seven years, 70% in seven years, for a host of reasons. The age of baby boomers who were typically CEOs wanting to retire, the number of people in 2008 who wanted to retire, and then oops, the market tanked. They stayed for 10 more years. A lot who started organizations that have become big institutional organizations, and they've worked there 25, 30 years, and now it's the time. Lots of other reasons. The Jewish community in particular, which is part of what Weinberg does, uh, not the majority of what we do, but it's part of what we do, uh, had an even more dire issue, which was the people leaving were being replaced by what you would call total outsiders. So the head of a large Jewish organization was being replaced by someone who didn't even work in the nonprofit landscape, let alone the Jewish community. And there was a concern about we don't have a bench, we haven't committed to talent, we haven't supported talent. So about 25 nonprofits came together, among them Weinberg, put funding on the table, and started a messy new startup focused on this work 
in the United States. It's led by a woman in New York City named Golly Cooks. She's a rock star. She can speak at any venue in any group and be amazing on this topic, FYI. And um, there are three main agenda items. One is building that pipeline, making sure that there is strong staff in all these organizations that are doing great work and are supported like a CEO onboarding program for 15 or so new CEOs to come together every year as a cohort, learn and do a lot of different stuff together. There is a big focus on um, leading places to work, because if you use the language great places to work, you have to pay for all that. So they did their own survey with Amy Bourne, who was an amazing consultant on the project. 7,500 uh, employees were interviewed this year alone to get those results, which by the way, Large institutions that didn't want maternity or parental leave and didn't feel any peer pressure, now there's a report that they're an outlier and they're all putting it in place. So it's changing the workplace. And the third focus is on the board membership and the engagement of board. And there is a survey that's about to launch that is leading pla places to work-ish, but focused on board members. It's a great intervention that's very disruptive in the normal landscape on purpose to try to move this agenda forward. But it demonstrates Weinberg Foundation commitment to making sure that it's not just the focus on the CEO, it's making sure there's a development, there's a pipeline, there's yes. a deep bench, there's a lot of people available to help yes, the organization board and grow. staff. Yep, that's the senior staff level. Okay, sorry, back to you. So um, kind of a follow-up, you, you were touching on the conversations um, that they, that uh, uh, funders and grantees can have. And um, one person asked, well, funding is important, so are the meetings with the different groups, such as the one you mentioned about the older citizens? And what is the process uh, for becoming part of those conversations and, and getting engaged? So, so the, um, the, the aging, uh, rural aging one was difficult because uh, uh, Johnny Hartford Foundation had done this before, and they wanted to limit the number of participants to 30. And we intentionally did. We asked them to try to identify the types of organizations. Um, it's one of those ones where I wish we had 100 people in the room. It was a great program. What we're hoping to do is when we have sort of takeaways from it, a list of things we're going to do, we're going to try to follow up and do more and expand the audience. Um, the, the other one that we did on workforce development was equally difficult because Aspen Institute put a, put a cap on it. And they likewise you know, said, we want one chamber of commerce. All right, those are the, so. If you want to make yourself popular in Northeastern Pennsylvania, tell two chambers of commerce that only one of them can come. <laughs> um, so, really, really, uh, uh, there goes the Christmas card. So, um, um, the answer is keep an eye on our website because a lot of the information about the, the, the collaborations and the convenings that we're doing is there. Um, if there's something that's of interest to you and we t don't know you, we haven't had an opportunity to meet you or work with you before, call us. Um, you can normally from our website determine the program officer, the program team right. member who has responsibility for your subject area. Don't hesitate to pick up the phone and call us. That's all we can say is we, we are, we are as, as open as we can be about having conversations about our involvement in, in your community. There's one uh, program staff mer member named Earl Millett. He's been here. A few of you have met with him and he's really helping to coordinate and partner and put in place all of the work that's happening in North Pennsylvania, Northeast Pennsylvania. Uh, with Rob and others. And so if that is something of interest to you, go to our website, find Earl, and shoot him an email or call him and say, this is who I am and this is what I'm doing. And when you're next in, Pennsylvania, in Northeast Pennsylvania, I want to see you, or how do I talk to Rob, or how do I get on that list, and have that conversation. Yeah, so and tell him we told you to call. We'll tell him. Many of you for <laughs> years worked with Kate Sorstadt, who has, who has moved on, and, and we'll miss her. But Earl is the new person who's going to be tasked with spending time in northeastern Pennsylvania. He's got a, a spouse. He's got a young child. But I got him to Old Forge, and I got him hooked. Okay, so now he, <laughs> if I feed him, he will come to northeastern Pennsylvania. So we found that we to found a sure. solution. Exactly. Well, I, I want to thank you and see if we turn over if there's any last minute uh, closing remarks you would like to make. Um, I'm good until like 5.30. I'm going to be around. But, uh, I'm happy to field questions. If you want to come up, introduce yourself, and, and talk, more than happy to, uh, uh, to get to know as many of you as possible. Um, use our website. Get to the hjweinberg.org, H.J. Weinberg Foundation. Foundation. And um, uh, hopefully we'll find many opportunities to work with you in the future on both the funding and as, as a resource. Yeah, and and I, I would just say we are cheering for all of your successes. And we don't know what we don't know. So tell us if we should know it. Um, and when you're walking out of the room, you're going to see a table with these little white boxes with our logo. 
and with all due respect to everyone else's tables with candy bars and cookies and healthy food, um, these are quote unquote Weinberg cookies and they're shortbread, one with milk chocolate and one with dark chocolate. They do not disappoint. <laughs> and um, the good news is as you go home tonight, if you like this, when you're eating the cookie, you're gonna say, that was great. So it's gonna make today even better. And we just wanna <laughs> say, it's something sweet to give all of you to say that we really do wanna cheer for your success. And thank you for caring about your community and trying to make a meaningful difference. Thank you. So I want to offer my sincere thanks to both uh, to both Rob and to Rachel for giving of their time this afternoon, and also for being a major presenting sponsor for today's conference uh, tomorrow as well. <laughs> so. Um, I want to just give a, a quick uh, note, as, as Rachel mentioned, there are the delicious cookies. I saw them. They're beautiful. Um, they're out on the table near the registration desk, so please stop by and pick those up. Um, this is just a reminder, there is the opportunity to rate each session um, in the app, and I encourage you to do so. Uh, tomorrow, once the conference wraps, we are going to have a full survey that will go out. Um, so I mentioned this now to anybody who's um, attending today only. Um, and I'd certainly encourage all of you to please join us. Um, I know it's been a long day, but I think we can all maybe use uh, a drink or a nice bite to eat if that's what you so choose. We have Doug Smith Duo who's going to be playing some music for us. And not maybe a lot of you have not been to the Trolley Museum, even though it's a nice little treasure in our backyard. So I hope that you can join us over there. Uh, there are going to be some groups walking. We encourage you to use the mall and the walk bridge if you're going to walk. There's plenty of parking if you would choose to do that. Um, and uh, Jeff and Ellen from Moses Taylor Foundation will be out by the registration desk to help answer any questions you might have. Please join us for, for that and get an opportunity to network and chat about today. We hope that you found it very fulfilling. And for those join us, of those of you who join us tomorrow, we look forward to seeing you um, in the morning and we'll get you out of here early on a Friday. We won't tell anybody that we're closing out the conference you know, earlier, so you can have a nice, hopefully, early weekend for yourselves. Thank you all very much. I'll see you at the Trolley Museum.